Happy Monday and welcome to Rising. We have a great show for you today. We changed up the lineup a little bit this week. We'll still see Bacha later on, but for now, Brianna Joy Gray is here. Hello, Brianna. It's wonderful to be with you on a Monday, Robbie. So, <laughs> so great to see you as well. Uh, what are we talking about today? I believe our president was in Canada, and so was I. I actually... Uh, Similarly, took a trip to Toronto uh, over the weekend to speak, uh, participate in a debate about uh, the regulation of social media, which was a lot of fun. And uh, I guess I inspired President Biden to <laughs> visit our neighbors to the north as well. Well, I look forward to getting your uh, kind of local man's <laughs> on the ground take on this next story, Robbie. President Biden and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau presented a united front against authoritarian regimes, they said on Friday. Biden visited the Canadian capital just days after a China Russia summit in Moscow. The two leaders stood side by side as they announced agreements on things such as semiconductors and migration. They also restated that their inseparable nations will remain committed to defending Ukraine. Hmm. So, I mean, this has gotten some pushback. The framing of them being kind of anti-authoritarian has gotten some pushback because of actions that each of these leaders has taken, not just, uh, you know, backing uncritically and without any kind of financial limitations, the war in Ukraine, but also some of the uh, actions that Trudeau took against the Canadian uh, trucker right. protests last year, freezing bank accounts and the like. I think this also is being contextualized in the shadow of the TikTok hearings, where in the United States of America, there are many legislators who seem to be really angling to ban the social media platform at the same time that they were pretty indifferent mm -hmm. to what happened with the Twitter hearings and evidence that the U.S. government was trying to influence our own social media platforms. So what do you make of all of this? Yeah. So we're going to talk about TikTok in greater detail uh, a little bit later. Um, look, I've similarly had a lot of a lot of those criticisms of Trudeau and of Biden, uh, particularly relating to COVID subjects. So I get why it sounds a little rich for them to be bemoaning authoritarianism. I mean, of course, there's no now, China also did a lot of those same, like, COVID, very militaristic lockdown-type things, you know, lock people in their homes for actually far longer than the U.S. or Canada did. Um, Russia started this war. So, uh, so I, 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 I think it is fine to, uh, for, for the, to, be, to portray them as the greater authoritarians. But what does that, at the end of the day, obligate us to do with respect to this war? Uh, you know, where they're, they're talking about NATO and we must defend every inch of NATO territory. That's fine. Ukraine isn't part Ukraine of NATO. Isn't. Yes. And we've spent, sent billions of dollars to them, not defending a NATO country, defending a country that explicitly is not part of NATO. If we want, we, and we kept them in this limbo for years that has helped, that is one of the um, reasons for this conflict in the first place. Russia not wanting uh, Ukraine to become part of NATO. Of course, if Ukraine had become part of NATO, then it would have been under explicit protection. It was in this middle ground, and if, we, if or we could have said, no, they're never joining NATO, and that would have been that, maybe. Yes. So w the, the status we left them in was just very, it was practically very stupid, because it helped get us to this point. Yeah, I think that's right. And what is still so frustrating over a year after the beginning of this crisis, Russia's invasion, is that that aspect of what precipitated the conflict is so absent from mainstream media coverage that you'll bring it up to folks and they still act completely surprised. I mean, just a few months ago, I interviewed Ro Khanna on my podcast, maybe it was last fall, and there seemed to be a real disconnect, even from what I consider to be a, a very intelligent and informed legislator who is kind of known on the left and gets accolades on the left for uh, his progressivism on um, Yemen and uh, other kinds of conflicts in the Middle East, but seemed to be genuinely naive as to why it was that so many leftists in particular were frustrated about the um, constant framing of the conflict as unprovoked and uh, seeming kind of historical ignorance about all of these moments where George Bush, was uh, too, was really criticized for making statements about Ukraine joining NATO that were seen to be kind of like poking at war and poking at Russia that he had to walk back. Joe Biden, before this conflict emerged, made some statements about Ukraine and Russia that were roundly criticized because of how antagonistic they were uh, to Russia. And now everyone is trying to memory hole all of that and pretend that there was never anything that the West did to provoke this crisis in the least. And the problem with that, of course, is that if you're not willing to re recognize what precipitated the conflict, you, there's almost no hope at all in figuring out how to unwind the conflict. I saw Trudeau was uh, marching in a, a parade uh, in the last day or so, I think 
after the Biden visit, and he, he got heckled. We don't have the rights to this footage, so we can't show any of it. But he was heckled by uh, some protesters saying, you know, why are you sending billions of dollars to aid in and continue this NATO proxy war? So people are clearly upset about this. People are upset about, you know, the treatment of the truckers and, and uh, you know, freezing of bank accounts and all of that that occurred in Canada. You know, we, again, I'm not, I'm not saying it's the same thing, but we, we still maintain a, a policy that I think is fairly authoritarian of not letting unvaccinated people who are not American American citizens come to this country. We turned just turned away Novak Djokovic. This is something no other advanced Western country does. I, it's not, maybe, maybe you don't think it's the biggest deal in the world, but it's, it's a stupid policy yeah, look, that we still have. We have two million people in prison, the largest prison population yeah, in the stuff. world, and not just adjusted for population. We have more people in prison than China does. So, I mean, look, and this isn't whataboutism or false equivalencies, right. but the reality is that Many world leaders use charges of authoritarianism to justify interventionist projects constantly, right? They talk about humanitarian abuses and authoritarian abuses and speech abuses and the like to justify all kinds of projects which you can or cannot disagree with based on their merits, but they're being shoehorned in via these like generalized principles we're all supposed to hold. And if all of these countries are guilty to a certain degrees of these kinds of accusations, then you know, what, what does that even mean? And should they just be making the case for why they want to intervene in one conflict or not based on the marriage without trying to pull on our heartstrings or say we're really doing this to save X, Y, and Z population? Yeah, absolutely. Here's an interview we had with a Canadian author outlining the frustrations that the working class have with Justin Trudeau. Let's watch some of that. BJ, I have to say, like, it, the, the, watching that, covering that, reporting on it um, from afar, it was... It was one of these moments where it was so clear to me what the right side was. I mean, I felt that we were watching the biggest labor action in certainly, it, you know, it, that I had ever seen. Um, and immediately the response from the powers that be, from Trudeau, from government, from the mainstream media here in the U.S. and certainly in Canada was these people are Nazis. And it was just a perfect encapsulation of something I think happens a lot, which is um, whenever the class divide threatens to be exposed, they call the people who ha are on the wrong side of it bigots. And I, I guess my question to you would be, I know what it was like to watch that. It was horrifying. What was it like to experience that? Well, let me answer by pulling out, uh, you know, my, my Megan David, so you can all see that uh, me being a Nazi is, is definitely a stretch. Um, and I said in uh, one of the many interviews that unlike Prime Minister Blackface, some of us actually have relatives that are still buried in mass graves in Europe. And it's quite insulting and quite disgusting. But that's all they have, because there's never any policy, there's never any ideas. And in this, this particular instance, there was never even, even an attempt, an attempt to talk to us and reach out to us, because all branches of government were blaming each other, this is what we learned in the commission, and trying to defer responsibility to one another. And then when nothing was getting done, they just, you know, Prime Minister uh, Blackface just brought down the, ha the hammer and decided it's time to crush the most peaceful protest in Canadian history, full of soup kitchens and bouncy castles and saunas and hot tubs and barbecues and all that sort of stuff. And the only um, violation that I could see the entire time was perhaps parking infringements. So this is what we've done now in Canada. When there's parking infringements, we introduce Canada's version of martial law. And it's come to the point that these people are so incompetent that they're dangerous. Yeah. Well, I quite enjoyed my visit to Canada. I, I, the last time I was there was, a, I'm from the Detroit area originally, so it's near near Canada. Mm -hmm. So we took a sixth grade field trip to Toronto. This was the, that was 30 years ago. <laughs> this was the last time, that was the last time I'd, I'd ever been there. Um, I The people were un failingly polite. Yeah. I know that's like the stereotype of Canadians. It was so accurate. I overheard an argument in the hotel bar between um, uh, the uh, the 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 waiter had accidentally overcharged one of the people one of the customers and and they were fighting because the, the waiter was desperate to get it off the bill and the customer was saying no I'll be back 
here tomorrow. It's fine. You can just owe me one. And they would not. Like, they were both being so nice about it. They were having a fight over who could be more nice about it. I just, that's so funny that you mentioned that because there was like a viral TikTok going around on, on Twitter last week. That yeah, was crazy. Did you see that where they, there was like a traffic incident and two guys got out of their cars? They were fighting, kind of wrestling on the ground. They resolved it. There was a clear winner. They shook hands and went back to their cars. <laughs> and just went off and people were saying this is the most Canadian thing that ever happened. I was also told I had to try a, I, I don't, I've never heard of this drink before. I don't know if it's a Canadian drink. I don't know if it's an Ontario drink. I have no <laughs> idea. But it was called a Caesar, uh, which is the name of my dog. So I, yeah, I of course, course, needed to try it. It was basically a Bloody Mary. Okay. Do you have any reasons of why they call it? Call I have it? no idea. Okay. And Bloody Mary is not my favorite drink, but I... I you liked I, it in Canada? I, I received it in the, the spirit in which it was intended, <laughs> and I did fit. But what about the speech stuff? Did you resolve uh, the country's uh, social media issues? So we had a debate on whether uh, social media is undermining democracy. Mm -hmm. It was a team debate. I had Jeff Jarvis was on my mm -hmm. team. I don't know if you know who that is. He's a professor. And, uh, well, I don't want to spoil it because it was taped, and I, I think it comes out later this week, but I was... Pretty happy about Okay, well, we'll all have to stay tuned for that and for the rest of the programming today on Rising. Stick around.